You're listening to another episode of the Young Investors Podcast, so sit back and relax as myself, Brandon, and my buddy Hamish discuss the latest in the world of finance and stock market investing. Now, a quick reminder before we get into the podcast is that nothing in this podcast should be taken on as personal financial advice. If you're ever unsure about your finances or investing and you need some help, make sure you reach out to a qualified financial advisor. But with all that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, Brandon. How's the weather? I've been uh, I've been instructed by Brandon to ask him about the weather. So, <laughs> it's, how's, it's how's the, the weather? Ice <laughs> I think it's the like the the world um, that's accepted the globally accepted icebreaker yeah. is just how's the weather? <laughs> like, it's just the baseline. Nice, nice weather we're having. The terrible weather we're having. Well, uh, let's have a look. It's actually sunny outside, but I probably don't want to go out there because probably that's the thing with Canberra. It's Deceiving. always like it's always sunny, mm. but when you walk outside. It's freezing. freezing. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit like that here too at the moment. It's, uh, it is sunny today. It's been sunny for, uh, well, yesterday it rained a little bit, but it's, uh, the weather's been picking up a little bit. So, um, I've, been, I've been happy about that. My mood is always significantly tied to ha- how the weather is. If there's, I don't know about you, but if, there's, yeah. if it's like cloudy and rainy and cold in the morning and like the house is cold, I'm in a terrible mood. But if it's sunny, mm. if it's like 20 degrees and I can sit out on the deck then I'm in a good mood. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so true. So true. It's funny how that happens, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's just, it's so, I, I, I really do find that. Like when I'm sitting at home and I've got the windows open and outside it's just gloomy, like you just, you just feel down. Whereas if it's sunny and warm, you just want to get outside, you feel so much better. It's actually a thing. I was just looking this up because I thought I remembered seasonal affective disorder. Mm. I mean that's probably a very extreme version of of what we're describing. Um, I don't think I don't think I'd quite quite say that I have this disorder. Um, but yeah, it's a type of depression that is related to changes in the seasons. There you go. Wow. Yeah. You get diagnosed. <laughs> yeah. But, symptoms uh, start uh, continue into the winter months, but it it's so true, and it's such a thing. Like humans, we need light. Light makes us feel mm. good. It makes us get out and about. It makes us, you know, happy. I don't know. It's just weird. Anyway, um, should probably not talk about that because I am no scientist by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's not go down that path for too long. But uh, this week we've got uh, we've got a lot of earnings to talk about. This is this is one of those weeks in earnings season where there's just so many companies reporting that we we obviously can't possibly get to even a fraction of them. So, we have to kind of pick out the the big giants. So, we're going to talk about Tesla, of course. Wouldn't be a Young Investors podcast without talking about Tesla for some period of time. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about Google and we'll talk about Facebook and there's a couple of other smaller ones that we may get to, but it kind of just depends because there's actually some uh, interesting news coming out of each of these companies um, mm. outside of the typical revenue and, and profit numbers that we normally talk about. So, mm. that's what we're going to get into in today's episode and hopefully we'll, maybe we'll get to one or two Q&A like questions from the audience. Mm. We'll uh, try to. The end. We'll see how we we'll, go. We'll do our best. But um, with that said, I'll just get sta- uh, get started by going straight into the sponsored segment. So, yeah. uh, today's episode is sponsored by ShareSite, which is an application that you can use to track the performance of your stock portfolio. So, you can basically use it to bring in all of your trades either automatically or manually uh, and uh, it will track all of the different types of gains that you experience from your investment. So, capital gains, dividends, if you have dividend reinvestment plans, it will do all of those calculations for you. Currency gains, if you're buying shares internationally or you hold foreign currencies, and then you can also use it for when it comes to tax time. So, ShareSite generates up to 10 different reports that can be used at tax time to work out things such as your capital gains, dividend income, and more. And at the moment, you can try ShareSite for free by heading over to sharesite.com forward slash young investors. That's site spelled S I G H T, sharesite.com forward slash young investors. So, you can use that link to sign up to a free plan and use it for as long as you want. Or you can use that link to get four months off a yearly subscription of a premium plan uh, if you want access to more features. So, uh, go check that out if you're interested. And thanks to everyone who has used that link and supported the podcast. Absolutely. All righty. Where should we start? You want to start with Tesla? Um, yeah. I, let, let's let's go. Let's just get straight into it. Let's we'll probably talk s- on Tesla for the next 40 minutes. So, strap <laughs> yourselves in, guys. We probably won't have time. <laughs> we'll get to the end of this segment. And we'll be like, wow, we don't have time for the rest of the year. 
<laughs> we'll be back next week when we finish. Uh, we won't even get through Tesla, right? We'll, we'll do it in two parts over the next yeah. two weeks. <laughs> so, this is going to be Tesla's earnings part one. I tell you what, oh, man, I, I'm such like, I'm such a Tesla fanboy though. I really do get swept up. I'm terrible. <laughs> like, I need to work on my self-awareness and I get these comments sometimes as well where it's like, dude, sometimes Brandon, you just got to shut up. But I get so mm-hmm. into the Tesla stuff. Anyway, look, it's a it's an interesting company. I I'm always fascinated to hear about the the little details about what's going on. With, with some companies, when they report earnings, it's kind of just like okay, they continue to do more of the same. And uh, mm. I don't know. Sometimes it's not that exciting. Whereas with Tesla, it's like oh, they're building a new factory and they've got this new car coming out. I don't know. To me, it's True. it's exciting, even though I'm I, I don't invest in the company. So that's- um, I'll, I'll cut you a bit of slack. I really enjoy okay. listening to it. Although I I wonder if we titled this uh, episode Tesla Earnings Part One, if how many people would, <laughs> would no, we can't that do that. We can't do that. That would just nobody that would, would. Yeah, that would nah. take, take it. <laughs> that that would tank this episode like you wouldn't believe. Um, but yeah, no, okay. Well, I'll, I'll uh, I appreciate you cutting me some slack, and I'll, I'll try and get uh, through these Tesla earnings uh, quite promptly. But what you say is correct. Uh, I I feel the same when it comes to Tesla earnings. Like, of course, I look at the financials, but mm. I re- the thing that I really like looking at is all the operational stuff. Like, what are they doing? What, what are they building? How the mm. factory is going? That sort of stuff. So I'll talk a fair bit about that uh, in this little section as well. So, of course, starting point with Tesla earnings is always car deliveries, which we already knew these numbers because they come out immediately after the quarter finishes. Right. So, this quarter, they delivered 201,304 cars, which is very impressive, another record. So, it's up 121% year over year. Uh, also, this is kind of a random thing, but I just felt it again. Uh, if if I sound a little bit strange, it's because I bit my tongue really, really hard the other day and I've got oh. this cut on my tongue and it's like causing oh. me to have like a little lisp at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> So I just noticed. Notice, I just noticed a few words there sounded a little bit weird. But uh, <laughs> but if I sound really weird in this episode, that's that's why because my tongue like isn't working at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Brad, it's broken. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty. Yeah, I'm broken. Um, anyway, getting back into it. So deliveries mm-hmm. were at a record. So Model S and X deliveries one thousand eight hundred ninety five versus Model Three and Y one hundred ninety nine thousand four hundred nine. Wow. Now, that Model S and X, in fact, I think it's only Model S's at the moment, is so low because they've just started building the Plaid uh, Model S, the refreshed Model S. Mm. Um, so, that number will probably get up um, over time. But yeah, Model 3 and Y, almost 200,000 Model 3s or Model Ys to live in that quarter. So, absolutely unreal. That's crazy. Did you see um, MKBHD's video on the uh, the new Tesla? I did. I did. It's very uh, impressive. Yeah, I highly recommend anyone go and check that out if you haven't seen the new um, Model S, right? Model S Plaid. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, Plaid. Yeah. Oh, Plaid. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, God, that steering wheel is shocking. I'm sorry. That, <laughs> the yoke. Oh, man. I hate it. I it's hate it It's just like a sports so car, really. Yeah. But it's, it, it is kind of impractical, isn't it? For like daily use, you wouldn't really want to use it on the daily. Yeah, I mean, can you can you order the car? Do you know if you can get the car with a normal steering wheel? I, or? I don't think you can. I don't think you can either, right? That's what no. I was from my from my very short amount of research I did, which is crazy to me because um, I would imagine that's going to put some people off, but maybe not. Maybe mm. I'm wrong. But um, anyway. for those that don't, yeah, for those that don't yeah. know what we're talking about, it's like a steering yoke, which is kind of like a race car steering wheel, or like a Formula One car steering wheel, mm. uh, where it's not actually a full wheel. Uh, you kind of just have two handles at nine and three to hold on to um, and then you manipulate the yoke like that. But yeah, for for like getting in and out of parks and spinning the wheel around, I mean, you obviously can't do that very well with the, with the yoke steering wheel. But yeah. anyway, um, yeah, getting back to it anyway. Uh, so, very good uh, deliveries this quarter from Tesla. So, the revenue was up 98% year over year to $12 billion. Um, so that kind of is, is, it's, it's impressive, but it kind of makes me laugh because you know, like the market cap on Tesla and then they do like 12 billion in, in <laughs> revenue <laughs> where we'll talk about Google a little bit later, but Google did, uh, 61.8 billion in revenue for the quarter. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What's, um, uh, what's Tesla's market cap at the moment? It's in the hundred, hundred 
billion range. I'm not right? sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But I'm not quite sure. Six hundred billion, and they're doing twelve billion in revenue a quarter. In, yeah. Oh my yeah. So god. A lot, a lot of future growth to happen <laughs> for investors <laughs> to be satisfied. I think. Um, but interestingly, there was also record margins this quarter. Um, so they had gross margin of twenty four point one one percent, operating margin of ten or eleven percent, really ten point nine seven. So this is. This is good. Like, you always like to see margins going up. It shows that Tesla's optimizing really well. They're keeping their costs lower. Um, they're still generating good amount of revenue. Uh, and and this is, you know, Elon's talked about this, you know, with every new vehicle program, with every new line that they make, um, they learn from the last one and it makes hmm. it takes them less capex. Like, with every new factory, it takes them less capex, less investment to achieve an even higher kind of production yield. So, yeah. uh, that's really promising to see. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the only other thing I would say on that is, I mean, how many how many vehicles did they deliver in last year? Wasn't Did they do 500,000? Am I getting that wrong? Yeah, yeah, total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's crazy that they're now doing 200,000 in a quarter and that they're mm. far, quickly approaching, I would imagine, a million vehicles delivered in a single year, yeah. which is um, crazy to me. That's the only mm. other thing I have to say the on thing- that. Yeah, the thing that I always go back to is they're still building, well, they're just kind of ramping up Shanghai Model Y factory. They've got Berlin, which is still yet to come online. They've got Texas, which is still yet to come online, which is going to build Model Ys. And then they've got like over half a million Cybertruck orders that they need to fulfill. So, Mm. there's like a lot, there's a lot of uh, future growth um, that should be coming Tesla's way. They just have to, you know, they have to get these- they have to get these factories done. That's like their, their number one thing at the moment. They need the factories to be finished. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so overall uh, margins going up, which is good for Tesla. Uh, 85% of their revenue was automotive. So 15% came from energy and other right. projects. So in terms of energy, 85 megawatts of solar deployed in the quarter, which is up 215% year over year. Uh, 1,274 megawatt hours of battery storage deployed up 204% year over year. So that business, that energy business is still vastly inferior to their yeah. uh, automotive business. But I mean, it's growing, which is good to see. Uh, Elon said uh, has said multiple times that one day he he thinks that the energy business will be equally as large as the automotive business. So That's crazy. Uh, if that comes true, then that will be like an an enormous growth driver for Tesla in the future. Um, now, free cash flow, uh, interestingly, came in at six hundred nineteen million, which is kind of funny because it's like really good for Tesla. But then we like it's a forty eight percent increase year over year. But then you look at any other like company that has a pretty much an equivalent market cap to Tesla, and they're doing just a lot, lot more in free <laughs> cash flow than that per quarter. Um, wow. But I guess it, it, we do have to consider in that free cash flow number. I mean, Tesla is not a company that just sits down and does nothing. They invest heavily in capex. They are always foot to the floor, growing. So they're investing like one one and a half billion dollars in capex per quarter. So they're certainly uh, they're certainly growing and, and investing heavily in growth, which uh, of course means the free cash flow comes down a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, the vast majority of the capex they're spending right now is is on growth initiatives on expanding their business, their capability to produce more vehicles. So, um, that's uh, that should be taken into account when you consider, mm. you know, the, the cash that is kind of being delivered to shareholders. I like to think of not just the cash that is left over after the business, but including some of the cash that they're spending to expand the business and grow future cash flows. So, mm. yeah, that is something you definitely need to think about with Tesla. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's why we, when we talk about, um, that's why, you know, we talk about cash flow for owners so much, or what yeah. you talk about a lot, um, is that, you know, if you're doing this modeling uh, as to what, you know, the company might be worth, you kind of want to exclude the stuff that they're putting towards growth and only include the maintenance capital expenditure. But uh, yeah. obviously, that's quite a difficult thing to do in some, in some instances. You really have to know your company well. Um, but anyway, moving on. So, current cash, we'll talk about balance sheet numbers for a bit. Current cash, 16 point Two three billion. Wow. Um, so they got a pretty decent cash cushion these days. I remember it was it wasn't too long ago they had <laughs> two billion in cash. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> they're looking much healthier in that department these it, days. It wasn't that much long. Uh, it wasn't long ago when you know we were looking six months out and being like, oh, they've got this debt that's due. That's that's coming yeah. up soon. They have to somehow get new debt, or it was yeah. like really touch and go. So it's good to see yeah. that they're in a much better financial position now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Still on the balance sheet, current ratio 1.5. 
debt to equity 1.16. So, you know, well, not the best, but um, a lot better though. That's um Yeah. That's not bad at all. Um mm. I've I've been looking at a lot of companies recently with a debt to equity, you know, in the 3 4 range. Um mm. and uh yeah, so 1.5 1.1 is pretty good. Yeah, I think it's good considering the type of business that they are. Like we always say, you know, oh, you, you want to look for, you know, this this current ratio, this debt to equity ratio. And it's like, yeah, but we're also like looking at software companies. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Whereas Tesla's like a, a vehicle manufacturer. So, there's it's like a, if you looked at an airline, there's going to be debt uh, with an oh, yeah. automotive manufacturer. There's going to be, it can't be like a Facebook where they've got like no debt whatsoever. Oh, of course. Um, a capital intensive business and one that is growing. So, the, their mm. requirement for capital is much bigger than a lot of other businesses um, and they're not overly profitable right now. So, they have to get yeah. money from somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah, it makes exactly. sense. Um, so, yeah, that's their balance sheet stuff. Uh, Gigafactory updates. So, they've got a few Gigafactories being built out at the moment. So, uh, they've got the one in Texas. So, they're building that out. Uh, the build out continues. They're getting prepared to start making the Model Y. Their aim is to make Model Y before the end of this year. Uh, after that, then they can start building the Cybertruck portion of the factory. So, I really, mm. I think cyber, they, they've been saying Cybertruck in 2021. I just, that's just not going to happen. No. no, no chance. Um, so, that'll be a 2022 thing, I think. Uh, Shanghai Gigafactory Model Y factory is pretty much done now. They're just continuing to ramp that up. Then in Berlin, the interior build out continues on the Berlin Gigafactory and they have begun testing their the tools in that factory, which is a positive sign. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, massive growth driver there with the factories. I mean, they've got, oh, I mean, Shanghai is pretty much done, but Texas and Berlin to come online as soon as they start pumping out cars. I, I just feel like those quarterly delivery numbers, like we're impressed at 200,000, but once these come out, once these factories come online, it's going to go a hell of a lot higher. Yeah, I mean, if the um, demand is there for it, then uh, they're gonna they're gonna explode <laughs> in the yeah. amount of units they're delivering if they get those online. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, when you think about, you know, they talk about how <laughs> how much demand they've got in Europe, but they just can't service the European market at the moment. Mm. Uh, that's what the Berlin Gigafactory is for, and then they've got all these Cybertruck orders which they have to fulfil. At some, it's like, man, they've got a lot of work to do. So yeah, it's pretty. I mean, it's a good position to to be in. Like they know what their demand is and they've got a backlog. Now they just have to f- like focus. You know, they don't have to focus on marketing. They don't have to focus on generating demand. They just have to focus on getting the factories built that can fulfill the demand that's already there. Just delivering. So, that's all they got to yeah, do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, all right. I've got two more quick things and then I'm done. I, I think I've done fairly well. No, no. This, is, this has been good. This has been absolutely okay. fine. Jam packed okay. and concise. Very e- yeah. excellent. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, full self-driving, that's something that people that follow Tesla love to look at. So, beta version 9 of full self-driving was released to a select few in the US uh, like a week or two ago. Uh, Interestingly, you can now also buy full self-driving as a monthly subscription option, which I believe costs $199 per month in the US. So... Pretty expensive, however, and it's very early, so I can't imagine too many people would be buying it right now, considering all the cars come with basic autopilot. Uh, I think this is just getting themselves set up for the future where, you know, people will be connecting their cars to the Tesla network and they'll be generating passive income. And I mean, if you have a Tesla and you you want to connect your car to the network and you make more than $199 per month in in letting it be a autonomous taxi then you know you're in the black you're making money on your on your Tesla and it's and it's a more for some people it's a it's a better option for them than paying the $10,000 upfront to have it have that uh, uh, full self-driving forever. So yeah, I think it's a smart move. I think there's probably a, quite a few people who are hesitant on the the ten thousand dollar option. Um, so to give people an option to to get in at a at a monthly subscription makes a lot of sense to me. I think mm. very interesting. And one hundred ninety nine dollars per month. People look at that and they go, "What the heck? That is so expensive." There's no way I could pay that. But I really do believe this subscription is more tailored to the people that are going to turn their Tesla into their own business. Like right. they they are going to connect it to that um, that autonomous taxi network. Um, they are going to make money with their Tesla. That's like what they want to do. So I yeah. don't think this is really targeted at people that just want 
to you know scoot around town themselves. Uh, I think it's more targeted to the people that are going to do that um, autonomous taxi thing. Uh, last thing I've got to talk about is the 4680 cells. Of course, this is Tesla's big project to uh, manufacture their own batteries for their own battery packs. Uh, not for all their cars, uh, but definitely for the Cybertruck, the new Model Y, uh, and I believe any other future cars will, will probably have the 4680s. Uh, because, of course, Tesla is cell constraint. They can't, at the moment, manufacture as many power walls and as, as many batteries for grid storage as they would like, because all of the cells that they've got available, even from worldwide uh, suppliers is is choked so mm. it, all of the cells are going into their cars so th- this is actually choking their um their uh expansion so they said well we got to fix that we got to build our own cells wow. so they are almost at the stage where they're confident that they can start producing these 4680 cells in high volumes they just noted that they're experiencing issues with a te- uh, with about 10 percent of the manufacturing processes to produce these cells at high volumes So, on the conference call, Elon said that it's not a matter of if, but it's just a matter of when. It's not a science problem. It's not can we do this. It's just an engineering problem of how are we going to do this. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, and that's that's pretty much the uh, the, the last thing I've got to update. I think that's the core. There's a lot of stuff going on, but I think that's the core of (laughs) of things that investors would be be interested in uh, on the Tesla front. Yeah. So, very interesting. I'm impressed. You you jammed so much into about 15 minutes there, I think, or so. So, uh, well well done on that. Um, I'm looking at the- uh, Sorry to cut you off. I'm looking at the waveform- on my audition file, and it is all me. Yeah, uh, mine's looking uh, very sparse. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll, uh, and I was talking very quickly. So I'm going to shut up now. That's that's what I've got to talk about with Tesla. Uh, very interesting, and uh, I think uh, I'll chuck it over to you, and, and you can do the same to me on on. Uh, uh, I don't know. You want to go Facebook? Well, yeah, we'll go. We'll go Facebook, and I mean, there's probably not as much going on. I think with Facebook as uh, as what's going on with Tesla, but there is a couple of. Uh, Interesting things that that Zuckerberg spoke about on the on the conference call, and I'll I'll get to those after I kind of go through uh, some of the key numbers first. So, uh, revenue for Facebook in the quarter came in at twenty nine point one billion dollars, which was up fifty six percent year over year. So, um, they're continuing to see big uh, and strong comparisons to the same period last year, which was muted a little bit by the pandemic. Um, of course, during the, that three-month period last year, a lot of businesses were cutting back on their brand advertising and um, that, of course, had an impact on on Facebook's revenue growth as well as Google's, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so, comparatively, their revenue is looking terrific. Um, in terms of how that breaks down within their business, they only have two products, uh, two uh, reportable segments, I should say. Um, advertising revenue, which was $28.6 billion, which is, uh, I don't know, maybe 97 or 98 percent of uh, mm-hmm. their total business. And then uh, the remaining $497 million in revenue came from their other segment, which reflects their Oculus VR um, and their really small payments business at the moment. So, um, then in terms of, I I guess, breaking down what created that revenue, uh, we can talk about uh, what happened in terms of their users. So, um, user growth, and I've I've only got the kind of the two headline numbers here, which are the daily active people. So, that's reflective of how many people logged into at least one of their apps uh, uh, every single day during uh, a certain period. Um, So, that includes Facebook, Messenger, WhatsApp, and Instagram. That figure came in at 2.76 billion, which was still up 12% year over year, um, which is pretty impressive considering that uh, you're talking about a comparison to a pandemic period where there would have been a ramp up in people staying home and, and spending time on these platforms. Um, so, comparisons are, are probably at, very, uh, at their most challenging um, looking from 2020 to 2021. And then in terms of monthly active people, so how many people logged in at least once to one of Facebook's apps, that figure hit 3.51 billion, which was also up 12% year over year. So, wow. 3.5 billion is uh, where they're at right now for how many people around the world at least once a month use uh use one of their platforms, which is really, really crazy. 
In terms of some of the specific regions, um, the US, the, the, the North American segment, which includes the US and Canada, that segment was flat. So that had quite um, challenging right. comparisons. And in Europe, they were down uh, 2 million. I think the number was uh, 309 million went down to 307 million or something like that. So in some of the areas where they have a lot of penetration, um, the comparisons to 2020 were were kind of difficult um, mm. because a lot of people were staying home. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting that it's uh, that it's flat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, as I said, it's kind of uh, to be expected. But I mean, no one's really expecting that much. I think from from Facebook's user growth from here on in anyway. Yeah, right. Like you have. That's what we've been talking about, isn't it? It's like what did we come to last time? That seventy five percent of people with access to the yeah. internet use Facebook's apps monthly or something like that. Yeah, it, it's, it's just an insane number. It's an insane market share that you just wouldn't project for. Like if you were looking at Facebook five or 10 years ago, well, not, maybe not 10 years ago, but maybe like eight years ago or something, um, and you were projecting, well, how many people could we say around the world will be using Facebook or, or one of Facebook's mm. apps? You would not guess that they could have captured 75%. Maybe you would say, okay, maybe one in three, maybe one in four people. Or something, but to capture seventy five percent is is crazy. I think, um, and that's also reflected mm. in what drove their revenue growth. So, you can think about revenue growth for for advertising as coming from two places. One is either they serve more ads to more people, right? So they have more users, or the users spend more time on the apps and and see more ads, uh, and then that way they can serve more ads, or the price per ad goes up. So that's kind of the, yeah. the, the two uh, sides of the multiplication that create Facebook's um, advertising revenue. So during the quarter, um, the number of ads served increased just 6%. Um, okay. So pretty small amount. Um, and again, that's to be expected. They're not seeing much user growth anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, either user growth or engagement is, is kind of where growth in that aspect comes from. But the majority yeah. of the growth came from an increase in the price per ad, which was up 47%. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's year over year. That's year over year. So I wonder if their, if their price per ad took a beating in Q2 last year. Yeah, it, it definitely did. And that's definitely yeah. contributing to that, uh, to that at some point. But um, right. this is what we should expect to see out of Facebook's growth, you know, over the next few years, I would think that yeah. user growth is going to be very challenging. But as a result of user growth slowing down, because Facebook's advertising platform works on a bidding system, you can kind of think of it as the amount of real estate stopping increasing, right? And what happens is, if there's a slowdown in the supply and the increase of supply, but there is still mm. massive increases in demand, that's going to drive the price per ad up. And I think we're yeah, going to continue to see the price per ad for Facebook ads continue co to go up because people, uh, advertisers are still paying significantly more for TV ads um, and, and other types of ads. It's um, insane, isn't it's, it? <laughs> uh, it? It's kind of crazy. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I've, I've, I've kind of blanked it, but um, the, the amount that Facebook's ads could go up um, uh, before they would even meet TV ads is, is, is astounding. Mm. It's many multiple times. So I think mm. we'll continue to see that um, over over the next few years um, rather than yeah. them increasing in, in the number of users. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And for those that really don't have, have never maybe used the ad platform on Facebook or don't really know much about it, I mean, the, the comparison to TV is just astounding because on Facebook, you have such good, uh, like just amazing targeting uh, features. You can target, really target your exact demographic that you want to advertise to. Like if I was if I was advertising my YouTube channel, I can look at the Google Analytics and I know that my audience is 91% male and pretty much between 18 and 30. That's pretty much it. And if I if I went onto Facebook and I wanted to advertise my channel, I can absolutely hit that demographic. I can actually I can make it so that 
no, an ad of mine is never shown to anyone that's outside that demographic. Yeah. It is only shown to the people in that demographic. But the thing about TV ads is you don't know who's watching. You can kind of guess with demographics based on, you know, what show you're advertising within, if you're advertising within the football or if you're advertising within like, uh, I don't know, a, a reality TV show. I can't even think of like The Bachelor or something. Mm. Um but to, when I when I look at the two different, like, if TV ads are more expensive, that just blows my mind because it's just like chucking your ad out to just a generic audience. I mean, that kind of advertising works for companies like Coca-Cola, where their demographic is just like anyone. Mm. But, um, yeah, the fact that I look at TV ads and they're more expensive and then Facebook ads, you can target so much. It's like, man- yeah, we should we should definitely be using Facebook ads much more, and so it it totally makes sense what you're talking about. That the, the the chances are the price per ad over the next few years for Facebook is going to go up, especially considering the fact that the real estate's not uh, there's not an, uh, a huge increase in the number of ads that can be shown or the amount of users it can be shown to. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, profitability, so net income came in at $10.4 billion, which was up 101% year over year. So, um, as has, was the trend last quarter, their costs rose at a much smaller rate than their revenue. And that, as a result, they were able to see quite substantial growth in their profits. So, costs only rose uh, 31%, um, which meant the operating margin expanded from 32% to 43% and uh, let their profit grow by over 100% year over year. In terms of their balance sheet, their financial health, they now have $64.1 billion in cash and short-term investments and no debt. So, they continue to be uh, one of, if not the uh, best positioned <laughs> uh, company in terms of financial health. I think they probably I reckon are. Google, Google, oh, reckon Google, give it a good run for its money. Google, yeah, Google has more cash and equivalents, but... I think they have a little bit of debt, but they do. you could, um, yeah, I mean, I guess on a net cash basis, Google's probably in a better position, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly a good, uh, certainly a good position to be in uh, as long <laughs> yeah. as they have investment opportunities to put that money to work, which is ultimately mm. what investment, uh, uh, investors need. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, Facebook has a, a lot, um, uh, that they announced actually in terms of what they're doing. Uh, Zuckerberg spoke briefly about launching uh, a product that he said that the next product they will launch will be smart glasses. Um, oh, gosh, that are here we go. going to be supported by uh, Ray-Bans. Um, so, I, wow. he didn't give many details on that. And I don't know if there is much details about it yet, but apparently that's coming. Um, and he also announced that their business is now transitioning from being a social media company to being a metaverse company. What uh, the heck? And uh, he basically outlined this whole vision that he has for, for where Facebook will go in the future. And uh, it's, I mean, have you seen that movie, Ready Player One? No, I haven't. I, I always uh, meant to see that movie, but I never did or well, read the book as well. What he's <clears throat> describing is very much that he, he, he envisions that people will be using the internet in that way. It's basically a movie about... I mean, people have ma massively immersive VR systems in their homes and right. they, they basically go into a virtual internet, right, to, to be immersed. Um, okay. So, Zuckerberg spoke a lot about this. He said that they're going to be investing a lot of money um, in this and that they want to create a platform that's not like a closed garden, that's not only accessible through Facebook's Oculus products, but that would be kind of this new kind of environment on the internet that people could join regardless of whether they had an Oculus VR headset or just a computer or just a phone or, or some right. other device. And the idea really is that um, rather than there being a significant disconnect from when you log onto the internet, um, that you're fully immersed. That instead of you know waiting in the the loading settings to to join your friends in the in the lobby, um, you can walk around with them in some kind of uh, VR <laughs> place and literally walk to the lobby, walk to the game. Um, that's crazy. <laughs> so that's that's you know obviously a big audacious goal that has absolutely no. Um, you know, it doesn't exist right now. And it's it's no. something that will not look like uh, what I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg envisions for, for maybe multiple decades. But um, it's the start of something that's uh, apparently going to be a big trans, uh, big uh, transition for Facebook. So, we'll just have to it's gonna see. It's going to be like the Matrix. 
I mean, have you seen The Matrix? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. I mean, <laughs> Zuckerberg recently, he's talking a lot about, if you've watched any interviews that he's done recently, he just talks a lot about these huge ideas and I find it really interesting and exciting, but I, I just, it's yet to be seen um, a lot of yeah. uh, what he t- what he's talking about. So, um, mm. we, we're really at a stage where we're just kind of talking about it and we have to we have to wait until they actually put billions of dollars into something and and we have something tangible that we can we can look at and maybe yeah. that'll start with these uh, smart glasses but I don't know I don't want to wear glasses so <laughs> yeah me neither <laughs> I my uh, when I wear, I've got like a a, t- a tall ridge in my nose so whenever I wear glasses they just don't sit on my face very well <laughs> yeah but right as soon as you said glasses I was just like wow they they're really going there I mean. This is Google Glass 2.0, Facebook edition. Oh, jeez. I don't know how... I don't know. I, I think I would be bearish on smart glasses. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe... I, look... Because Google Glass was such a flop, right? But yeah. maybe technology has progressed to a point where they can make a much better product, so... Yeah, he, here's my thoughts on it. I think that people would will not wear them if they don't look like normal glasses and they need to look i mean i have the only glasses that i wear are like sunglasses that are ray-ban sunglasses and they have very very thin i don't even know what they're called just the arms of the sunglasses right and they can't do that right now and they probably can't do that for an extremely long time to put a computer into really thin framed glasses um but if they can do that then and it looks very much the same. It still looks good. Mm. It still looks like glasses and it's not, you can't tell from the outside that you have some kind of computer on your face. Then um, there, there's a lot of interesting things they can do with, uh, with, with the glasses, I think, in terms of providing yeah. information of your surroundings, um, you know, more details about safety, for example, stopping people from crossing the road when they're, you know, when the, when they don't notice that the light is, is red or whatever. So I think there's a lot of application there. Um, MKBHD did a, uh, did an interview with Mark Zuckerberg where they spoke a lot about that. Um, so I recommend you check that out. Um, if you're interested. Yeah. I'm just looking at Google images of the Google Google Glass. Oh, it's terrible. And it's just... It was yeah. awful. See, that's exactly the opposite of what you were saying, <laughs> yeah. where it literally looks like you're wearing a computer on your face. Yeah. Um, I would never I don't wear know. I mean, something like that. No, I'd never wear something like that. But I don't know. Zuck's all about... Um, uh, what should we call it? Augmented reality, virtual reality. Yeah. So, and I mean, they own Oculus, right? So, maybe they do have the technology to make a, a superior uh, set of glasses than than what was what Google made. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, it's, uh, I'm going to need some convincing on that one, I think. But we'll see what comes out. <laughs> Me, I'm, just see. I'm, I'm in the same camp. I'm not convinced until I see something that is uh, yeah. that's created. So, yeah. we'll just wait yeah. and see. Um, all right. Is that all we've got for, for Facebook? Yeah. Now, before we get into this next segment that you'll be taking, I'm just going to turn my phone off because I know I'm just going to set off my phone's, oh, uh, yeah, true. my phone's assistant. Uh, oh, I'm sure people gosh, know what I'm we're going to about, about to talk about, but I'm going to- Hang s- on. Be right back. I'm just going to throw- I'm literally going to go and throw my phone out of the room. Right. Give me two seconds. Phone's off. Google can no longer be alerted a <laughs> hundred times while we- Last time we spoke about- uh, Wow, God, last time we spoke about Google, my phone was just vibrating constantly. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I went on some like weird stuff while we were just talking about, you know, when you just trigger it and then you'll just find yourself on some random web page just from the ramblings that you spoke about afterwards. Mm. So, yeah. Sorry, I only caught like half of what you said there because I, I, I literally took my headphones off and threw my phone out of the room. That's all right. It was a bit of a monologue. So, go for it. Okay. Take us through Google's earnings. <laughs> <laughs> did, did we actually manage to do that without needing that section to be edited? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we don't need that to We be actually edited. got through that. Yeah, That's yeah. amazing. Of course. Wow. All right, Google, here we go. Um, so, Google, revenue for the quarter, <laughs> yeah, as I said before, comparing it to Tesla, um, $61.88 Whoa. billion. Dollars. Just think about that. Think about the scale of that number. And that's for one quarter's revenue. Ridiculous. One quarter's revenue. So, it grew 62% year over year. So, again, we're seeing that same thing with Facebook with these advertising businesses. Q2 last year really wasn't flash. So, mm. now the year over year numbers look really good. Um, interestingly, like- 
for, for Google, I always get surprised by this, but $61.88 billion in revenue, but operating income, only $19 billion. Mm. I really- I just always think that they should be keeping more of that revenue, but uh, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's still pretty like operating margin, 31%. So, you know, you can't- it's, it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> but I always think, you know, I feel like it should be more. I don't know. Maybe I'm just going crazy. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess a big part of Google's advertising is that they- they they pay a lot out of that revenue, so they pay. Um, so they pay YouTube creators, oh, yeah. for example. But they also pay if you run ads on just like a random website. Um, oh, I can't. The the name of the program is is um is leaving me right now. But um, you basically have a revenue split as well with Google to run Google ads on like any random website that you've created. So um, I'm sure that comes into um, part of the reason why their operating margin isn't as as uh, as amazing as it it, it would mm. should be. I guess if you just took strict that they're just running ads and that there's very yeah. little cost associated with that. That makes sense, actually, because when you think about it, um, like for, fa- for, uh, for Facebook, for YouTube, it's like mm. we get 55% of the advertising revenue. So, if they count all that ad revenue in, you know, revenue and then they give 55% of it to us, then mm. yeah, that's already like- uh, So, if, if you think that if, if all this revenue was uh, YouTube revenue alone, then the max operating margin they could possibly make would be 45%. Um, yeah. But that obviously wouldn't happen because they've got all the overhead costs and whatnot. So, yeah, that's actually a really good point and something I hadn't think about it. That makes sense, Hamish Hodder. Thank you for saying that. Um, okay. So, diluted EPS uh, mm-hmm. was $27.26. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's correct. I was wondering whether that was a 37. No, $27.26 versus $19.34 expected. Wow. Big beat. So, yeah, it's a big beat, isn't it? Uh, well, and again, it- like- we don't we don't care about these like <laughs> yeah, you what can, analysts think. We don't care, but that is still a big beat. Yeah, you can think of it like did Google do really well or did the analysts do really bad at yeah. projecting? <laughs> oh, that's so true. Anal- I mean, honestly, <laughs> analysts get this stuff wrong all the time. All the time. Oh, yeah. Um and that's why I really don't think people should pay attention to, you know, what the analysts think. I mean, it's a nice guideline to get gather some context, but yeah, never you never want to put place a bet based on what an analyst thinks, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, they did very well on EPS. So uh, out of the sixty one point eight eight billion in revenue, fifty point four billion was from advertising. So that's up sixty nine percent year over year. Uh, this is something interesting that I uh, that I saw in this article. Retail was by far the largest contributor to the company's ad growth, said mm. Google Chief Business Officer Philip Schindler on the earnings call Tuesday. I find this interesting because to me, this says, you know, this is a, a pretty good sign of economic recovery mm. because what it tells me is that retail stores- are now happy to start spending big on advertising again. Because remember, that was what we were even talking about last week. When the economy started shutting down, profits were getting hurt. The first thing you do is you cut your advertising budget. Mm. So, Google, you know, Philip Schindler from Google um, saying that retail was the largest contributor of the company's ad- advertising growth. I feel like that's a positive sign. Yeah. I mean, the majority of retail is still done physically. So, if they're seeing big uh, contributions in, in ad growth from, from retail, then a lot of that is probably coming from physical retailers as well. And I guess that's just part of, uh, you know, everywhere around the world is, I mean, in most places at least, a a, a lot looser on their restrictions of how you can move around and and people are a lot more confident to to move around the world um, than they were say six months ago um, mm. so uh, yeah that that kind of makes sense to me um, that yeah. that would be one of the areas that was cut off a lot during the pandemic and is now as a result driving a lot of the recovery a lot of the growth in Google mm. yeah. Hey, get this, re- YouTube revenue. Let's talk about YouTube. Oh, yeah. YouTube revenue came in over $7 billion, up 83% from last <sighs> year. Get, but they, get this, this is something they put in the CNBC article. This is drawing close to Netflix's quarterly revenue, which was $7.34 billion. Oh, so wow. I've never, I've never actually drawn the comparison YouTube versus Netflix, but 
that's actually kind of interesting, I think. Yeah, that that is interesting because I guess they're both video platforms. They both yeah. have completely opposite business models. One is advertiser driven and one is, is subscription based. Yeah. Um, but they're both uh, competing for, I would imagine, a similar like uh, a, a similar type of engagement, right? Like people yeah. who are watching something after dinner um, or exactly. rather than, I mean, they're still competing for engagement with, with Instagram and that sort of thing, but it's kind of a little bit different. People watch, go on Instagram for very short periods of time quickly, you know, frequently throughout the day. Whereas this is kind of like entertainment long. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I watch no, a lot well, of, I watch a lot of YouTube back to back. So yeah. I watch it in a similar way that I would watch like a Netflix movie or a TV show. Yeah. Well, this, this, I think you're right because sometimes when I'm like just walking around, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, do I want to watch the new episode of whatever on Netflix or would I prefer to go and watch a bit of YouTube? Mm. I actually do. Like, now that you say that, I, that is that is true. I actually do. The Netflix and YouTube are competing for the same time from me, I guess. And I feel like that would be the same for a lot of people. Like what you say, you know, after dinner, people are like, oh, do I go watch the my, my favorite YouTuber's new video or do I watch, you know, whatever new show is on Netflix. So, yeah. I think you're right. And it's a, it is an interesting comparison. So, I, I would be- I, I might keep following that from quarter to quarter, uh, YouTube versus Netflix. So, I find it interesting. Mm. Um, also, Schindler said- uh, So, this is back to Philip Schindler, Google's chief business officer. Mm. He said, uh, connected TVs is the fastest growing com- consumer surface that we have. Mm. stating how the company now now has 120 million people who watch YouTube on their TVs every month. Right. This is this took me by surprise, but I guess if you think about it it's not a surprise because they've probably like really exhausted the growth on say like desktop or laptop or mm. uh or yeah. or phone. Um but I was still surprised that you know 120 million people are watching YouTube on their TVs. I very rarely watch YouTube on my TV. Really? That's yeah, it. the only time I do yeah. is when I want to- Because I find the interface, the app that's on my TV, I don't know if it's just because I've got an old TV. Maybe I don't have the latest version, but the app is really clunky and uh. hard to use, hard to search. Um, the only reason I watch on, on, on TV is if I want to watch something specifically in 4K because my yeah. computer monitor isn't. Um, that's but yeah no you, you you watch a fair bit on yeah I I watch probably ninety five plus percent of YouTube on my TV but that's a really good point that you made oh. I would imagine that a lot of people maybe haven't bought a TV in the last like say three years where the YouTube app on TV has I'm sure has become much more user friendly probably. than say a TV three years or more older or something like that, or, or maybe even yeah. a couple of years, I don't know. Um, or you don't have an Apple TV device or something. But yeah, I watched all of my YouTube on TV and the okay, app's really good. On a, I, I think I got a TV maybe a year ago, so relatively new. So, yeah. that's interesting to me though. But yeah, that just made me realize that maybe, maybe as people upgrade their TVs over long periods of time, every five years or so, normally, I guess, um, that number will will increase. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, another interesting thing that came out of the uh, report was YouTube Shorts, the company's new TikTok competitor, just mm. surpassed 15 billion daily, daily views. Um, that's up from 6.5 billion daily views in March. Uh, so, that's that's quite interesting. Um, I didn't- I don't really know what the deal is with YouTube Shorts. Do you, do you know what the it. deal is? No, it's- I mean, it's- I, I, I mean, they well, almost yeah. talk about it like it's its own app, but it's not its own app, is it? No, no. I mean, no. I've noticed now that you can. I, look, I don't really know how any of this stuff works, but uh, you can clip. <laughs> you can like clip YouTube videos and um, make right. medleys with them, and and kind of do I don't know TikTok kind of stuff, short right, short form okay. videos. But yeah, I, I mm. I've never I haven't really gotten into YouTube Shorts at all. I don't mm. particularly find it that yeah, interesting. Me but I mean, the the viewership is there on YouTube, so I feel like they can still make a pretty decent platform out of it if they wanted to. Yeah. Um, 
All right, moving on. Sorry, I'm getting a bit sidetracked here. Google other revenues, so Play Store, Chromecast, Chromebooks, Android, Google Apps, all, all that sort of stuff, mm. brought in six point six billion, wow. up from five point one billion last year. So they're getting growth in their other revenue segments. And then the other big part of their business is cloud. So Google Cloud brought in four point six three billion, which is up from three point oh one billion a year ago. So in all of their, so obviously the advertising is the big behemoth, but in also their other revenue and also their cloud business, they are getting very good revenue growth pretty much across the board. Um, However, of course, that's revenue growth. When you actually look at operating income, so you take into account all the operating expenses for each of those segments, they have Google services, which is basically the advertising business, Mm -hmm. uh, gave them operating income of $22.3 billion. Then Google Cloud, negative 591 million. And then their other bets, negative 1.4 billion. So right. interestingly, the advertising business is really the only part of their business that runs you know, profitably. I'm, I was very surprised that Google Cloud still runs at a loss. Yeah, I yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, I haven't I haven't looked into why they're not profitable in cloud just yet. Whether that's due to you know, have, have, whether they're doing more investment in that area or, or something like that that's coming through on the income statement. I'm not sure, but yeah, very interesting to see. Other bets is uh, continuing to be a big loss, uh, a big big yeah. loss for them. But I mean, they can afford that, right? They've got yeah. a huge amount of cash, and they need to be investing and making bets Mm. on new industries. So, it makes sense that they're doing that. I see other bets as like VC. I see it as like venture capital. Oh, yeah. You know, if if you're a venture capitalist, you're buying businesses very early on or you're investing in businesses very early on and maybe like 90% of those businesses fail. They go all the way to zero, you lose everything. But the idea behind VC is that, you know, the 10% of businesses that uh, you find- that don't go bust actually take off. Yeah. And, you know, while you might get nine out of 10 investments that go to zero, you might get one out of 10 that's like a thousand X or 10,000 X. And that makes it all worthwhile in the long run. So I feel like the Google other bets is kind of like a VC model that they do, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. So I, I, I am, would imagine that other bets would run, you know, uh, at, at a loss because, I mean, if a bet of Google's went bananas, it would become its own revenue segment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. I mean, if they have, I don't, I don't know, I think they have maybe five to 10 smaller bets that they're operating. Um, a lot mm. of them are extremely small um, just in the concept stage. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're investing in a lot of different industries, autonomous driving and um, energy, a bunch of different things that I'm sure a lot of people are just not aware of. And um, yeah, I mean, a lot of those industries that they're putting little seeds out into maybe they don't exist yet, but they're probably going to be hundred plus billion dollar industries. So, um, if they mm. can get the lead in some of those industries or a good market share, then they'll do extremely well. Like you said, if they get one out of a hundred, <laughs> one out of one out of thirty or something that yeah. does extremely well, then that'll be you know can add considerable revenue to their business long term. Yeah, absolutely. All right, last little thing. I know I've been talking about Google for a long time, um, but I wanted to go through some balance sheet numbers just because Mm -hmm. we were comparing it to Facebook. So, for Google, balance sheet, current, uh, so cash and cash equivalents currently sits at $136 billion. (laughs) Uh, Uh, Current assets, $175.7 billion. Current liabilities, $55.7 billion. So, current ratio of 3.15. Wow. Then total assets, $335 billion. Total liabilities, $97.8 billion, of which $14 billion is long-term debt. And overall, they got a debt-to-equity ratio of 0.4. So, pretty decent. That's a pretty tasty-looking uh, balance decent. sheet. Pretty <laughs> decent. <laughs> <laughs> that might be an understatement. Yeah, I think that's probably... Yeah, I think you're right. I think Google has probably the best balance sheet out yeah. of any company ever. I mean, so, the only way they could make it better is, is really if they ditched the long-term debt. If they just ran with no debt at all, yeah. then, I mean, that would just be ridiculous. But, I mean, there's probably a good reason because they could easily just get rid of that debt. So, there's probably a good reason why that debt's there. Um, one that I do not know. And then in terms of free cash flow, um, $16.39 billion worth of free cash flow in the quarter. That's a lot of juicy free cash flow. Investors love to see free cash flow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're doing extremely well. The stock's been doing extremely well as well. I wonder how it uh, did on the uh, did on the news. Down a little bit. Facebook was down as well, actually. Facebook was down right. 4%, I think. So, 
I don't know. They're doing well, but expectations are high again. Um, I mean, yeah, but that's the th- yeah. Sorry, I was you go. You go. All, all I was going to say was, I mean, pre-pandemic expectations were through the roof, and then the pandemic brought everything down to earth. Everyone was like, "Wait, let's actually look at what these businesses are producing," and everything mm. kind of came back to earth for a bit. But six, you know, six months after the pandemic, after March of last year, and even now, stocks are just rocketing through sky high um, prices. So, mm. uh, yeah, it's it's kind of strange. Yeah. I mean, if you just look at business operations, then yeah, it's like crazy high. I th- The thing, of course, that we have to remember with these businesses is because they've got such a rock solid balance sheet, like there's no way they, they're being put out of business. Um, you do kind of have to- fa- And they've got so much cash on hand as well. You kind of have to factor that in as well when you do your valuation, um, like adding- their you know mountain of cash to like the figuring what that's out uh, what that's worth per share yeah. and then kind of adding that to your valuation of what you'd buy your shares at um, so like if you just looked at business operations these these stocks would always be like super super high um, but it's important to remember that part of the reason they trade at such premiums is because they're, they're, they're literally sitting on a mountain of cash, um, which will come to the shareholders or be used in the business at one point or another. Um, and then there's also probably a premium because they're at such low risk of bankruptcy. Yeah, that's that's uh, it, right? It's the earnings, but also the quality of earnings people look for. Um, exactly. It, it, that doesn't uh, equate equally across all businesses. Some businesses may produce a lot of profit, but they're in a much more precarious situation in terms of their mm. survivability uh, or their risk of going out of business or losing that revenue stream. So, yeah, Google, Google, Facebook as well, I think, but Google particularly is in, a, in an extremely strong position um, currently. Mm. So, that's why people yeah. are willing to pay up. Yeah, exactly. All right. With that said, should we uh, just finish off with a couple of Q and A questions? Yeah, I, I th- I'm surprised we uh, we actually had time. Well, I mean, we didn't get to all of the uh, the earnings we wanted to do, but maybe we'll save some for. We'll do that next we'll week. We'll save some for next week. I mean, we're going to have yeah. so much to do next week. So, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll do our best to get through as much as possible. Um, yeah, we probably have time for one or, or, t- or two of these. Uh, this is a fun one. Do you want me to- I'll read this one to you. All right, sure. Uh, hey, guys, your podcast has been getting me through my one hour drive to work in the morning. Uh, thanks for your great insights and interesting topics discussed every week. Thank you very much. I'm uh, thanks. Glad- yeah, glad we, can, yeah. W- glad we can help your drive to work be a little bit, a little bit easier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, when will you guys shed the young description in your podcast name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I was actually thinking about this the other week. I was like, when when do we stop becoming the young investors? <laughs> uh, we're always young at heart. Um, I don't know. I feel like should should we just do like a in I don't know when when we both are in our thirties or or forties we should just do a full rebrand and we'll call ourselves the Middle Age Investors <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> yeah, and then when we're when we're over sixty, we'll call ourselves the Elderly Investors Podcast. Yeah, that'll go down <laughs> real well. That that'd be great. Yeah, <laughs> full I mean, rebrand. I wish we could just shed the young and just go the Investors Podcast, but unfortunately, that network already exists. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I remember the, you remember the original, what the original name of this podcast was going to be? Oh God, the Intelligent Investor or something like that? Yeah, we were going to call it the Intelligent Investing Podcast because, you know, it's a great play on words. I mean, it's a reference to Ben Graham and his book, The Intelligent Investor. And, uh, but uh, we, we actually recorded the first, the first ever uh, podcast with the idea that our name was the Intelligent Investing Podcast. And then we got it ready to go and we sh- we're so stupid. We didn't even like look at whether that already yeah, existed. We're so and sure enough, the Intelligent Investing Podcast already existed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. We- so, we had to re-record the opening of that uh, of that first podcast. Yeah, we, 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 we would- <laughs> We we yeah. were two very incompetent uh, podcast creators. I mean, what's changed this. really? No, nothing's changed. We're still in, we're still the same. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for oh, thanks for tuning in. We're we're glad that uh, we're able to provide a little bit of uh, entertainment and discussion. Absolutely, yeah, we appreciate it. All right, should we do? We'll do one more. All right, uh, I'll ask this one to you. <clears throat> hey guys, I understand you can't give any financial advice for legal reasons, um, but I'd like to ask, what advice do you have for new investors? 
regarding things like reading annual reports and researching new upcoming IPOs and risk factors regarding that. Thanks for all your time. I hope you can talk about my questions soon. Well, you bet we can. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, in, in terms of so, I mean, in terms of IPOs, I mean, there's just whenever you ha- are looking at an IPO, there's going to be a severe lack of information about that business in most yeah. cases. So, um, I typically avoid IPOs because I like having a lot of information available to me to make a decision. Um, I like looking at a track record of a company over a couple of decades usually and seeing, reading what the management team had to say each year and you know what what was good about the business and what were the challenges and whether they overcame them and that sort of thing. I really like to immerse myself in as if I was kind of on the executive team at the board meeting every, you know, rocking up every year and, and listening to the, the successes and the problems. And you can only really do that with businesses that have been around for a really long time. So, um, that's yeah. kind of my thoughts on IPOs. But I mean, in terms of reading annual reports, I think a lot of people get, I mean, the, the thing that just comes to mind is, um, I think a lot of people get really intimidated by the fact that it might be 150 pages or 200 pages. Mm. But when we say read an annual report or when someone says I read an annual, I read the last five years of annual reports, they're not saying they read every single word in each of those annual reports. There's certain segments that you want to focus on in particular. Um, for me personally, I like to read through most of at least one, usually the latest one. But when I'm going back over the, the past few years, like for I was looking at a company recently and I the company was IPO'd in 2000 and I, I literally read parts of annual reports for every single year for 20 years. But I didn't read right. the entire annual report. I read the, uh, I, I read the shareholder letter. Um, at the beginning, I read parts of the management's uh, analysis and discussion is really interesting. And then yeah. also parts of the business description, just to kind of see how they're describing the business and what's changed over the time. So, um, that's kind of my uh, my brief advice on uh, on reading annual reports. Yeah, I think I'm pretty much with you. If you're looking into a company for the first time, then you probably want to look at an annual report more thoroughly than if you're just kind of keeping up. Um, if you're already invested or you're just keeping up with a company because you want to, you will want to read all of the description about, you know, what the company is and what it does. Uh, you want to flick through and have a, have an understanding of what the management believes the risk factors to the company are. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to have a good understanding of that context. But for example, like in each of you know, Apple or Facebook's annual reports, all the risk factors pretty much the same. Um, So, you know, once you've got an understanding of the risk factors, then it's just like, okay, yeah, I know what's going on. Um, But yeah, you you probably do want to get a good, I mean, the annual report's basically everything you would ever need to know. So, if you're just approaching a company for the first time, then you'd want to read a fair chunk of that. Um, You'd want to get a good understanding, like I said, of what the company does, how they make money, what's most important to them, what revenue segments are they, you know, are they growing um, and what what are they focusing on? How's the financial stability? Look through the financial reports. But I think from, uh, if I'm just keeping up with it, then I'm very interested specifically in the um, in the financial results and the management's explanation of the financial results, um, just to see where the growth is coming from, like all that context that, you know, Google's talking about their different revenue segments and which ones are growing and which ones aren't and what they're focusing on and how that's going. Like that's information that we just want to keep up to, up to speed on from like quarter after quarter after quarter. But like I, I didn't, this quarter, I didn't go back and read through all of the risk factors to Google's business, for example. Um, Definitely. But yeah. All right. Yeah. On that note, I think we'll wrap it up. We've been going for an hour. Thanks, Brandon, we for have. joining me as always. All good. Thanks, everyone. Good for fun. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, next week, we'll be covering probably a lot more earnings as well. And uh, if you have more questions, though, that you want us to uh, answer, we'll try and get to a couple every single week. Then head over to the YouTube version of the podcast at youtube.com forward slash the young investors podcast. Just click on the latest episode and leave your questions as a comment on the latest episode. Thanks to ShareSite for sponsoring. As always, sharesite.com forward slash young investors if you want four months of a yearly subscription or to try out their free plan for as long as you want. Uh, But with that said, we'll see you guys next week. See you next week. Tesla earnings part two. (laughs) See you then. (laughs) See you guys. See ya.